Faith is such an integral part of the Christian life. Every Christian must have faith in Jesus Christ and God alone. And today, we're going to look at a beautiful example from faith from a Gentile during Jesus' time, not a Jew, uh, not, not a disciple of Jesus, but a Gentile who was considered like off from the covenant of God. And we're going to look at the amazing story of faith he has. But before we get into that, would you please join with me in a word of prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your word. And thank you, God, that you share your word with us and that you love us, God, and that you're loving enough to give us your word to come to know you, God. And Lord, I pray that right now, God, that you would show us what true faith is and that you show us and teach us how to have faith, God, and convict us for our lack of faith, Lord. That's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So open with me to Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Opening with, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is dreadfully tormented, is at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And that hour his servant was healed. So we find ourselves immediately introduced to a man named the centurion. We don't know uh, exactly who this man was. We don't know his name or we don't know his family, but we know that he was a centurion. And in the Roman army... A centurion was one that led a hundred Roman soldiers, hence the term sen in centurion. And the, typically, these men, these centurions, were very respected, very, very well liked amongst their Roman officials. They were typically men of great prestige, very noble and honorable men. And this is, seems to be definitely true with this centurion. He comes up and approaches Jesus. And he tells him that his servant is incredibly sick. In fact, he says specifically that his servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now, what's interesting about this is that the centurion was a very high-ranking, very elite member of society. This servant of his, by most centurions, by most high-ranking officials in the Roman army, would have been looked upon with a very low view, most people wouldn't have held this servant, which must esteem. Most people wouldn't have really cared if this servant was paralyzed at home. In fact, by Roman law, they were allowed to kill their servants if they were deemed no longer useful. So this centurion, according to his customs, has every ability to put this servant to death. But this shows the heart of the centurion. Instead of killing the servant and getting a new one, he goes out and tells Jesus and requests of Jesus that he heal this servant of his. Why? We're here introduced to the centurion as a very loving man. This man is clearly a special man. He has tender affections toward a servant, which was very rare in that day. But here's what the centurion asked Jesus. It says he comes to him beseeching him or pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. The approach of the centurion here is nothing short of beautiful. The centurion comes up to Jesus, pleading with him. And here we can take spiritual lessons. When we come to God in prayer, we ought to come pleading. We don't want to give merely requests. We don't want to come unintentionally and weakly and just feebly. We want to come before God pleading, coming before him boldly, coming before him beseeching him coming before him, pleading the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do when we come to God in prayer, when we come to God in pleading, when we come to God making requests on behalf of ourselves, on behalf of others, on behalf of our nation, on behalf of the church. We always want to be making ourselves in a state of humility and a state of contrition and also in a state of pleading. And that's what this centurion does beautifully. 
Now he says that his servant is lying at home paralyzed, which means the servant is unable to move. The servant is rendered utterly useless for the task he priorly and he priorly fulfilled, which was to do chores around the property, to do chores for the soldiers, to do chores for this centurion, and now he's completely incapable of performing that task. And not only is he paralyzed, he's dreadfully tormented. He's in great anguish, this servant of his. And the centurion goes above and beyond to plead for this servant. Now look at what Jesus responses to the centurion. Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. Jesus, to this Gentile centurion who was hated by the Jews, says, I will come to your house and I will come and heal this servant of yours. Jesus showed his willingness to come and help this man, which is amazing because here Jesus shows his absolute lack of partiality. The Jews hated the Roman rule, and this centurion represented the yoke which the Jews were under. Jesus, if he wanted to merely please the Jewish people, would have rejected this centurion. But he wanted to teach his disciples and the, his followers a lesson, to love all people. Jesus showed his love for the Gentiles by coming and being willing to, no, he didn't actually come, but he showed his willingness to come to this man's house, showing his great love. But here's what the centurion says in response. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. The centurion understood something very important. He understood his place. He understood that he was not worthy to have Jesus come into his dwelling place. You and I must understand that we're not worthy to have Jesus live in what, within us. You and I must understand we're not worthy to enter into the rest of God. We're not worthy to enter into heaven. We're not worthy to step into the presence of God. We're simply not worthy. And it's a beautiful thing that the centurion recognizes his own unworthiness. And that's how we ought to be. We ought to think quite often long and hard about the fact that God loves us because it's even more amazing when we consider the fact that we're unworthy sinners deserving of his condemnation. And the centurion understood this beautifully. Now, in Jesus' day, according to Jewish custom, if you, enter, if you were a Jew and you entered a Gentile household, you were considered ceremonially unclean. So it's interesting that Jesus showed his willingness to enter into this man's house because Jesus was willing to be pronounced unclean according to the Jewish tradition of that day. Now, he wasn't unclean according to the law, but he was unclean according to the Jewish tradition. And so Jesus clearly wasn't afraid here to break Jewish tradition. He was not breaking Jewish law, but he would have been afraid to break Jewish tradition. And he clearly shows that he's not afraid of this. So some say, well, the centurion didn't want to inconvenience Jesus. The centurion was really saying, don't come under my roof because that'll be inconvenient for you. It'll cause stirs with the Jews. But I think there's more to that. Certainly, probably the centurion was aware of that. But I think there's so much more. I think the centurion's aware of his own unworthiness, of his own sin, of his own spiritual darkness. And he realizes that this great holy man is far greater than he, and that the centurion is not worthy to have him under his home. He shows incredible faith here. He says, only speak a word and my servant will be healed. The centurion understood that Jesus didn't need to come in person to heal his servant. The centurion understood that all he needed was Jesus' word. And sometimes you and I just have to pray that God would speak his word into our lives. We don't need to have some sort of miraculous sign or to have some sort of miraculous touch. We just need the word of God. We just need God to speak his word into our hearts and to speak his word into our lives. And that is more than enough. Here this insurance shows even greater understanding of who Jesus is. He says, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. The centurion recognizes that Jesus speaks by a high authority. The centurion here sees that Jesus is speaking under the authority of the Father. Even this Roman centurion who was considered outside the covenant of Israel 
understood that Jesus spoke under the authority of a great and mighty God. He says, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion understood that Jesus has authority over all. The centurion understood the sovereignty of God in that his word is powerful, and that a word can change everything. But this is how we ought to be. We ought to be like these servants who when God tells us to go, we must go. And when God tells us to stay, we need to stay. We ought to act like this. We ought to act in subjection to God, to be willing to go where he sends us, to be willing to stay where he calls us to stay. No matter the cost, no matter the price, no matter how strange it may seem, you must go where God is calling you. You must do what God is telling you to do. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. Jesus was amazed at this centurion's faith. Jesus was amazed at this centurion's word. Jesus was amazed at this centurion's understanding. And what does Jesus say? He marvels at this man. Now, there's only two times in the Gospels where Jesus is said to marvel or be astonished or be amazed. And it's at the faith of this Gentile centurion, and it was at the unbelief of the Jewish people. Isn't that interesting? Two times Jesus was said to marvel at the faith of the Gentile centurion and at the unbelief of the Jewish people. Quite interesting. And here's what Jesus said. He said, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Within Israel, Jesus had not seen such great faith that this Gentile centurion had. And here Jesus says something quite eschatologically interesting. He says, and I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This word east and west emphasizes the entire globe. Jesus is saying from the entire globe, people will come and sit down in the kingdom of heaven. Jew and Gentile alike will enter into the kingdom of heaven if they believe in Jesus Christ. And guess what the privilege we will have? We'll be able to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Though the Gentile may not be from the loins of Abraham, he is certainly of the faith of Abraham. And here it's clearly seen in this centurion. And I hope that it's seen in me and you that we have this faith that this centurion had, that we possess a faith that believes in the power, in the might, and in the word of God. Do we have this faith? Now, here's what happens to the Jews who did not have faith. Not all Jews, but the, many of the Jews of Jesus' day and many of the Jews in our day, sadly. Jesus says, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. The sons of the kingdom represents the Jewish people. Now, Jesus isn't saying all Jewish people. There's many great Jewish Christians. But Jesus is saying, unfortunately, many of the Jewish people, many of the sons of the kingdom, will be cast out into utter darkness. This is hell. This utter darkness is hell. And many of the people who were so certain that they were going to go to heaven because of their relationship or because of their bloodline or because of their heritage were sadly mistaken. And what I don't want to happen to you is that you find out that you're sadly mistaken, that you assure yourself you're going to heaven because you go to church or because your parents are Christians or because you host a Bible study. I hope that's not why you think you're going to heaven because that's not. The reason you go to heaven is because of faith. And that's what the centurion showed. It's not because of works. It's not because of your family line. It's not because of what you've done. It's not because you're Christians or parents or because you go to church or because you read your Bible or because you have good theology. No, it's because you have faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on to say that in this place, in this place of outer darkness, namely hell, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is the way Jesus often describes hell a place with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, why does Jesus say that there'll be weak of na- weeping and gnashing of teeth? Weeping and gnashing of teeth carries a connotation that in hell, there will be utter and extreme agony, spiritual agony, physical agony, 
emotional agony, agony of every kind you can imagine. There'll be grinding of teeth and wailing, extreme wailing because of the sadness of being rejected by Christ. Why? Because they first rejected him. Because the sadness of eternal separation and damnation. Now, oftentimes when we see how talked about in the Bible, Jesus talks about, or, or we, we understand that there's the flames of hell. Jesus talks about the story of Lazarus, where he talks about the burning of hell. And Jesus uses the word Gehenna for hell many times, which was the Valley of Hinnom, which was where the Jews burned all their dump. So it, hell clearly has this idea of fire and brimstone. But it also has this idea of darkness and despair. And so if you were to ask me, do I take these descriptions of hell literally? Well, I would tell you, no, I don't take them literally. Why? Because you can't have a place of absolute darkness with fire because fire is obviously bright. So I don't take these descriptions literally, but hold on. That doesn't mean that hell's not a bad place. Hell is a terrible place. So the fact that I don't take these descriptions literally doesn't mean that you're off the hook here. In fact, the fact that I interpret the descriptions of hell metaphorically makes it far worse. Essentially, fire and darkness are used to describe inexplicable, ineffable pain, agony, and suffering. Fire used to describe the great pain. Wailing to use to describe the great spiritual agony, the great emotional agony. It all comes together to describe this terrible place. So my non literal interpretation doesn't make it better for the unbeliever. No, it makes it far worse. It's an indescribable place of dread, which you certainly don't want to make it to. Jesus wraps this up. He says, then Jen just says to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. The faith of the centurion in this instance led to the healing of his servant. And faith can heal you, not necessarily of your physical sickness, though that can be the case, but certainly of your spiritual sickness, of your depravity, of your sin. God is willing to save you. You must cry out to him in faith. You must show him that you have a willing spirit. Do you? It's a question only you can answer. Would you please join me in a word of prayer before we end? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your word. And thank you, God, for giving us faith. Lord, it only makes sense that we should love you, God, but it makes no sense why you love us. And thank you, God, that you love us, unworthy, sinful sinners. Thank you, God, that you love us. And God, I pray for those watching who don't know you, God, please help them to cry out to you for grace, to cry out to you, and to put their faith in you, God, and believe that you died and rose again and confess you with their mouths as Lord. That's all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me, guys. I'll see you next time.